against Russian demands. Apologies. Okay, we're going to record this for you. Um, so let me let me start again, maybe for all of you. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and I'm really glad to have all of you here with us today. So we've started this year with many overlapping crises and security challenges, and of course, against the background of a global pandemic. But the current tensions in Ukraine and continued Russian troop movements have raised serious concerns. With the US and NATO pushing back against Russian demands on Ukraine and Russia in turn, threatening military action, the current moment seems particularly fraught. This is a complex multi-dimensional situation with very real potential consequences for Ukrainian citizens and indeed the entire region. But the, the broader global security implications are also front and center. This is also an evolving situation. There is a meeting happen There's a meeting happening today between a diplomatic meeting happening today between Russia um, and the U.S. And there is also going to be a statement expected from the Russian government today. So there is a lot that is going on. So I'm Branka Marian. I'm a senior researcher at Project Plowshares, and we have an excellent group of panelists who are going to help us unpack some of these complex issues. So joining us today are. Peggy Mason, the president of Rideau Institute and a former Canadian ambassador for disarmament to the United Nations. Peggy, so nice to have you with us. And then Dr. Pavel Podvig, a senior researcher at UNIDIR and who's also joining us from Geneva. So thank you, Pavel, for taking your evening hours, spend time with us. And of course, Cesar Jaramillo, our executive director here at Project Plowshares. We're always glad to have him and hear from him. And I have a number of questions, and I'm sure the audience will have some as well. This is, again, a very exciting and very concerning topic. And we encourage the audience to use the chat function uh, as we go along to engage with the discussion. My colleagues and I will monitor for questions. And if you uh, would like to ask a question, also please use the Q&A box as well. And we'll, we'll try and get to them as, as many as possible today. So without further ado, maybe Pavel, I'll start with you. And let me start by asking you, how do we situate the late, this latest crisis um, in Ukraine in relation to broader security challenges between the, U, uh, between the US and Russia, including um, as they relate to the exp expansion of NATO? And is this more of a dangerous schism than we've seen previously? In other words, what is the essence of the current crisis and how did we get here? Uh, well, thank you. Thanks everyone uh, for joining. Uh, I will try, although I must say, of course, the uh, the current crisis uh, has uh, can be traced back to many uh, many issues uh, from uh, many parts of the spectrum. Uh, so it's really difficult to uh, single out uh, uh, something uh, specific, uh, but and. In, include that these issues include, of course, uh, a NATO expansion uh, that that's been going on for some time now. Uh, but uh, more recently, uh, it was uh, the we've seen the de facto dismantlement of um, many arms control agreements that managed uh, security in Europe, uh, and that would include the INF Treaty, uh, the Open Skies. Uh, well, the CFE, if we go back, uh, the conventional forces in Europe, and if we go even further back, uh, there is this uh, ABM treaty, anti-ballistic missile treaty, that which which actually set a very uh, dangerous, in my precedent, of kind of a pulling out a, a major state pulling out of a major arms control uh, treaty. So, so that that trend certainly contributed to the uh, uh, the current uh, tensions. Uh, of course, uh, I would not dis kind of discount uh, uh, or underestimate the, uh, the, the role of internal uh, political dynamic in Russia. If, if you follow the politics, you all know that uh, it's, uh, a, there are some issues there. Uh, so uh, it's still, uh, I, I must say, it's still a puzzle uh, why uh, all of that is happening now. I mean, you could try to answer that, but uh, there, there, I don't think there any, anybody can have a, kind of a good answer to that. Uh, but nevertheless, well, we have what we have. We have the uh, buildup of our forces. There is tension. There is uh, uh, the United States uh, uh, insists that uh, there is a plan to 
uh, uh, start the military action in Ukraine. Uh, in uh, briefly, if if I want to, if I were to uh, kind of a, f try to find the uh, the the one uh, issue. Uh, there, uh, that would be the fact that uh, whatever the mechanisms of security uh, or arms control or disarmament or international security in general, uh, as uh, they've been evolving over the past uh, many years, uh, it uh, it was uh, felt that uh, they are Russia felt uh, excluded from that process, and more than that, not just excluded. Uh, but it was increasingly uh, this is, you know, Russia found itself in a situation when uh, those mechanisms were built sort of against Russia to counter Russia to contain Russia, and uh, of course Russia has uh, uh, there are reasons why people are doing that, and uh, of course if uh, for example if Crimea didn't happen. Uh, that uh, uh, most of that uh, or some of that wouldn't happen uh, as well. Uh, but nevertheless, even uh, what, I, what I would say the reasonable Russian initiative proposals, whether it's uh, the moratorium on uh, missile de 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 deployment in, in, uh, in Europe, uh, or again, if we go back, uh, we can think about what happened to the uh, conventional forces in Europe treaty, not to mention the ABM treaty and this whole NATO expansion. So there, there it's, uh, again, Russia has uh, uh, its share of blame, of course, and, uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, that was uh, the kind of a situation where Russia wanted to be heard, listened to. Uh, and well, that's what it took in a way, uh, sort of the very uh, strong signal uh, that uh, that was sent. And now we can see that, uh, yes, US and NATO are saying that, oh, we are ready to discuss missiles. We're ready to discuss this and that. Uh, and I hope that this will end up there sort of with a discussion. And that's, that's my uh, kind of a, I, uh, silver lining to this whole thing. Thanks. Thank you so much, Pavel. I know that, that that was a lot to ask because there are so many dimensions, you know, and you start talking about one aspect of one treaty, and then of course there are so many others. And so maybe I'll, I'll get Peggy to weigh in a bit as well. And in terms of the, Peggy, what are some of the key concerns uh, about the breakdown of dialogue uh, that we've seen for European security? and for US-Russia strategic stability. And, and for our audience, I think it would be interesting to also know how would a country like Canada be impacted by some of what you, you know, you, I have a sense, you have a sense of, and then what Pavel has laid out as well. Oh, sorry, Peg, if you could unmute, yeah, apologies. <laughs> Somebody always has to do that. Uh, hello, everyone, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I guess uh, I'm not sure I would characterize it as a breakdown in the sense of it being a recent phenomena, as I, as Pav, Pav, Pavel, I think, has made, Pavel has made very, very clear. Um, and, and I feel duty bound to note, um, uh, you know, the media hype, uh, you know, uh, and a situation where the Ukrainian president Zelensky himself has tried to dampen down the idea of an imminent invasion to no avail. You know, the media, you know, perplexed. Why, why, why would he be do saying this in, instead of perhaps looking more closely at, at the situation? And, um, you know, it's interesting. I haven't heard, I mean, I've heard in Canadian, recent Canadian commentary, but I haven't heard in the international media about a discussion of exactly what, what capacity lies behind the Russian troop buildup. You know, 100,000 uh, troops sounds on the border, of course, sounds incredibly alarming. But as uh, I think military strategists would point out, and at least one Canadian one has recently, um, that that is not a force that can, uh, can invade all of Ukraine, can go to Kiev and can hold Ukraine. And there's no, apparently no evidence of, of Russia preparing itself to send in reinforcements. So I'm not suggesting for a moment that this isn't, a thre this isn't threatening to all concern, but one has to keep it within, within, uh, within all proportion. 
And I don't think, I think the media hype is part of the problem. Um, uh, all, all, all of the, and in getting into this idea of, of, of uh, this, this being a long-standing problem, which, which Russia, as, as, as Pavel has pointed out, has finally got everyone focusing on. I mean, uh, Russia's security proposals, the so-called security guarantees in the form of two draft treaties are, I mean, the elements of it are well-known, long-standing Russian concerns. The new element is putting them all together, um, as I think Pavel noted recently, in two draft treaties, and in frankly forcing everyone to pay attention through this uh, this Russian uh, brinkmanship, if you will. Um, and uh, in terms of there not being a breakdown, or or at least uh, the U.S. Russian strategic stability talks have in fact gotten underway as a result of the June summit, with three rounds to date. So the new element, of course, it is very good news that NATO and Russia are engaging again in talks in the NATO-Russia Council, which has not met for more than two years. Such dialogue forums, and this really needs to be repeated over and over, are not rewards for good Russian behavior. They are essential mechanisms for resolving differences and are, needing, are, are needed more than ever in, uh, in crisis situations. The dialogue uh, on European security and how the architecture might evolve in ways that do not compound tensions and risks of confrontation and escalation. Of course, the dialogue broader, broader than NATO, potentially involving the OSCE. And the interrelation of this dialogue uh, and the Russia-USA bilateral strategic dialogue are vital not only to European, but global and therefore Canadian security. And that really speaks to the impact. How is Canada impact? Canada's impact, uh, Europe is impact, impacted, the globe is impacted uh, you know, by, uh, by Russia, US bilateral strategic dialogue going off the rails and, and it seems to be getting back on again and by serious discussion of concerns of all of the concerns of all sides in the European context. And of course, that leads into the arms control dimension, which we're going to be discussing a bit later. So I guess what I want to do at this point, because this really goes to Canada's role, I mean, the precipitating point of all of this discussion is the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And I want to mention how we, Canada, should be using our influence to assist in the implementation of the Minsk Accords. This is the immediate crisis that is hanging over any attempts to deal with broader European security and transatlantic security relations. Now, implementation of the Minsk Peace Accords will not address all the outstanding issues clearly between Russia and NATO uh, or Russia and the United States, but it will solve the core issue of the status of Ukraine with de facto neutrality following an agreed democratic process, including a referendum. I mean, all of this has been negotiated and agreed and affirmed by all sides. I mean, Ukraine, USA, Ukraine, Russia, they have reaffirmed full implementation of the Minsk Accords as the only way forward. The G7 has done this at its last foreign ministers meeting and at summit level. NATO has done this in its last summit in Brussels. Yet most media coverage rarely even mentions the accords, let alone their central status in peacefully resolving the conflict. So what Canada needs to be doing is making it clear to Ukraine. I mean, we have influence. Canada has considerable influence in Ukraine. We've put a lot of money, we've put a lot of civilian, not just military effort and support for good governance in Ukraine. We have to make it clear to the Ukrainian and Canadian publics that we fully support and are fully behind their full implementation. Um, and this of course would help President Zelensky who has powerful hardline factions who are totally against their implementation, uh, who reject differences of view, very real differences of view between Eastern and Western Ukraine. And, and in fact, that was the election platform the elect that President Zelensky ran on, get the Minsk Accords implemented, but he's had no, he's had very little help until recently. Now France and Germany are back in the game again. And, um, and so the final comment I guess I'll make, it's a positive one because we've actually, for so long we've seen Canada's 
saying nothing, silence about diplomacy, pandering to hardline elements in the Canadian Canadian diaspora who, vigor, who vociferously, vociferously oppose the mixed agreements. But now, as expert commentators like Andrew Rizzulius have pointed out recently, Canada has perhaps moved from the NATO hardliners on Ukraine more to the middle of the pack with a very measured military response on the, and without the provision of armaments and our stated emphasis on deterrence, but not provocation and diplomacy as the only way forward. Interestingly, all those comments being made by the chief of defense staff and the minister of defense, not the foreign minister, but nonetheless reflecting the view of the government. So um, I'll stop, I'll stop there. Um, Look I'll stop right there. Thank you. No, but I mean, it, it's been really interesting seeing this uh, this sort of play out in in Canadian media and in discussions, and, and sort of then the difference differences it seems uh, from various uh, parts of government. So I wanted to maybe feel this to Caesar. Um, you know, Caesar Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland, of course, has a, you know a real sort of affinity for Ukraine and has described this situation as a struggle between um, democracy and authoritarianism. And indeed, some commentators have suggested that meeting even some of Russia's sort of demands would uh, you know, amount to appeasing an autocrat. So what is your take on such readings of this situation? Thank you, Branka, and thank you to my fellow panelists and, and to all the participants uh, for making the time. That's an interesting, interesting question, and that's an interesting framing from the deputy uh, prime minister, a struggle between democracies and authoritarianism. And I think, you know, it's it's true, but only at a very basic level. And, and, and moreover, I don't think that oversimplifying the matter in such a black and white uh, matter is, is going to, to serve anybody's uh, interest here, any of the stakeholders, not the West, not Russia, not the efforts uh, aimed at de-escalation. And, and I think that uh, a poor prescription at the outset, a poor prescription is not going to be conducive to having adequate responses to this crisis. And if it's this, this very appealing, easy to digest, Putin is an autocrat acting as an autocrat and we can't appease bullies narrative, you know, a lot of nuance is lost in that equation. I think there is a very urgent need for nuance. There's a there's a great lack of self-awareness in some of the analysis in the media, in the pundit in academia, and there's a great need for, for lack of a better term, for empathy in international relations. And, and, and the, the, the operative word here is nuance, because when, when one says that there is some legitimacy to the security concerns that Putin is expressing, it doesn't mean that one is apologetic for the otherwise autocratic tendencies that undeniably Putin has exhibited or anything like that. Or if you afford some legitimacy to those security concerns, it doesn't mean that you're rejecting the notion that the West needs to feel secure. Here, and that there is some some validity to collective security arrangements. So 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 these two these realities can coexist. But the important point here, I think, is that. <clears throat> Whatever the, the assurances, uh, there's some debate now about whether Russia received assurances uh, after the unification of Germany uh, as to whether the NATO would, would, would expand eastward or not, or, or, or the extent to which these assurances were official or non-official, verbal or written. I think that's an interesting backdrop, but the, the reality the demonstrable, observable reality is that NATO has indeed expanded eastward. That is undeniable. Whatever, however official these assurances may have been after the fall of the Berlin Wall, so so NATO has uh, expanded eastward just since uh, since 1999. More than a dozen uh, Eastern European uh, countries have joined NATO, including former Soviet republics. So one doesn't have to be, you know, too much of a cynic or or, or pro Putin or anything like that to recognize, you know, most countries in the, in a similar situation situation would have security concerns if they see a military alliance encroaching closer and closer to their borders. So I think this is this is not just, uh, I wouldn't frame it as a, a struggle between democracies and, and, and authoritarianism, even if there are liberal democracies on one side and an autocrat on the other. I think this is primarily a struggle over the security arrangements that have dominated the West and the, and the globe in the post-war period. I mean, and, 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 and these uh, security arrangements are being challenged to 
by Putin. And the way in which he's challenging them, this is not an endorsement, you know, of, of threat, of course, of diplomacy or anything like that. But the undeniable fact is that that that, that these are being challenged and the, that the West, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a spirit of common security, would do well to revisit these security arrangements, the stability of said arrangements, the way in which they are perceived in Russia and elsewhere. And also Russia needs to needs to, to, to make an effort to, to, to step back its, its, its Militaristic posturing and rhetoric, etc., because it serves nobody's nobody's uh, uh, purpose. So there are different, various dimensions to this crisis. You know, at a, at a, the most immediate level, we have the dimension of Ukraine that involves Ukraine in particular. But this is, in a way, and not to oversimplify the the, the question of Ukraine. Uh, uh, but this is, in a way, you know, the last drop in the bucket, so to speak. But a broader dimension to this to this conundrum has to do with the security arrangements in the post-war period and how sustainable they are going to be into the future and how Russia is going to position itself. Other countries that are not directly linked, linked to this crisis, like China, how are they going to position themselves in the in this in the in the in the security arrangements? So, so that is a debate that is not going away. Whatever happens in the in the next few days and weeks around Ukraine. I think that is a debate that the West will need to confront about, you know, the, the nature of secure arrangements, the raison d'etre of, of, of NATO, the, you know, the, 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 the impetus for expansion, for further expansion eastward, uh, etc. And yet another level, not to get too esoteric about international relations, but I think we're also witnessing a gradual transition away from a unipolar order dominated indisputably by the United States. And, we, and you have other rising powers, some acting out to get attention in this in the in this transition. China waiting sort of in the sidelines. But uh, so 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 there there's various levels to this dimension. The last one I would emphasize is the nuclear dimension. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland said this is a struggle between democracies and author authoritarianism. I think this is also a struggle between two nuclear armed sites, the likes of which we haven't seen really since the end of the Cold War. We have the, you know, the 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 U.S. on one side and the and the, and the, and the so, uh, and Russia on the other side, and, and so we have more than 90% of the world's nuclear weapons in this equation. So that alone is problematic, and it is little consolation. That you have liberal democracies on one side and and an autocrat on the other, because you know the mantra has long been that there are no right hands for long for wrong weapons. And wrong weapons, of course, being the nuclear weapons. So, in the, from this perspective, there is no high ground. There is no moral high ground. There is no virtue signaling that 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 that, that would deny the reality that this is a, a delicate matter because it involves nuclear weapons. We hope and and assume that we it will not escalate. But such is the nature of escalation that that we may reach. Uh, outcomes that neither side wants or intends, and yet we get there. So we need to be very careful about the nuclear dimension of of this crisis because because of who the players involved are, and uh, and and further down, I think uh, scholars and analysts and observers of nuclear deterrence will also have a, a good petri dish to analyze about what happened here because because I get it. It is. It is in real time. This is a very interesting, uh, a very in interesting through which uh, to analyze nuclear deterrence and nuclear brinkmanship. Thank you so much, Cesar. And, and Pavel, I want to get to you because you have this, um, and I highly recommend it to everyone. A really great article in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, where you've nicely laid out the sort of various military technical responses that Russia could pursue um, in response to unmet demands. And, and the, some of those touch, of course, on the, the nuclear aspect. So what type of responses, though, do you think um, sort of do you, or do you see as most likely? Yeah, well, uh, hard to tell exactly, uh, uh, of course. Uh, one thing is, uh, I, and I just want to kind of draw everyone's attention to this, uh, is that uh, and back to the point that uh, uh, Piggy made uh, about the uh, the, uh, the quite a bit of hype uh, uh, around this situation, uh, because uh, what what Russia actually officially said that uh, if its demands are not met and demands are include those treaties, Russia would resort to uh, some military technical measures, and that somehow was uh, interpreted or turned into the idea that uh, Russia is threatening to invade Ukraine something like that, uh, which is not quite what 
the officials, uh, Russian officials said. Uh, so, but you you see that there is a lot of uh, yeah, there is a lot of other. I mean, it's hard to tell to what extent uh, it is based on some hard data, and to what extent it's just kind of a uh, self-generating noise. Uh, and I've seen uh, more scenarios of invasion that I would ever want to see. Uh, but what's interesting is that, uh, I, and I again, there there is a bit of kind of a, a hope here, is that uh, when I when I talk to uh, my Russian colleagues and those who are who know Russia, uh, who uh, and those who are in Moscow, uh, you you don't you don't get a, an impression that uh, something like an invasion or military operation is is in the cards at all. So, uh, and I hope that they, uh, they, uh, they have a better feeling for that. And in a way, the closer you're to Moscow, the less uh, kind of hype up you are. <laughs> so, <that's, laughs> uh, <clears throat> so uh, but yeah, but still uh, there is this idea of a military tank response. And so what does it mean? So what, what would it mean? Uh, Unfortunately, uh, that would probably mean more weapons in Europe and probably more uh, dangerous weapons and including probably more nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, and uh, but it is surprising, and I, I try to do this to uh, do it in, in the article, sort of if you run through the uh, list of things that there are uh, this list of options. There are not very many, actually, uh, because uh, the, there, there's nothing like dramatic enough to that that could uh, be kind of an adequate "quote unquote" uh, answer. Uh, but uh, my biggest worry is that uh, there, are, there are there are things that we will see uh, things like uh, new uh, nuclear uh, ballistic missile uh, uh, missiles in Europe. The uh, the intermediate range ballistic missiles that are uh, capable of what, as they uh, say, uh, hold, holding uh, all uh, European targets at risk. Uh, so, and, and in a sense, it it might be uh, the kind of replay of the SS twenty uh, Euro missile crisis of the uh, late seventies, uh, early eighties. Uh, in new circumstances, uh, it uh, could be uh, could become very difficult to manage, uh, and it could become uh, very contentious. And and I I worry uh, that part of the uh, technically uh, Russia has this option, uh, and uh, my concern is that uh, this kind of a threat is not taken seriously enough by uh, NATO, by the United States. And in fact, you could see uh, people, uh, when I talk to my colleagues on the uh, kind of NATO side, some of them saying, oh, no, but these are, we, if we bring more uh, our missiles in Europe, then we will force Russia to negotiate and to disarm. Uh, to which, uh, which is a very strange position because Russia has already suggested to disarm. You, there is no need to go through this cycle of crisis and uh, danger. So, uh, as I said, uh, the uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the these military technical uh, response uh, measures uh, are likely to mean uh, more more weapons and uh, more destabilization and more. Uh, chaos, if you want, in Europe. So, and but again, in my view, there is a path out of this. It's pretty narrow. Uh, there, there are proposals on the table, uh, the talks, and uh, these are not going to be difficult. But uh, it, uh, it could be done. Thanks. Thanks it's so not much. going to be too easy. <laughs> it is going to be difficult. Yes. It it's, yeah, I think oh, but on the, on the, at the same time, it, it may not be very difficult. It, it's it, what well, they I mean, there are all we know how to do these things. It's not uh, it's not rocket science, as they say. Yeah, and, and absolutely, the you know there are still continued diplomatic discussions, right? Which is it's interesting. I think you're right when you look at media and and you know in Canada, for example, for me, and then I look at media in you know in Eastern Europe and the Balkans, and it's a very different discussion, and I guess a very different sense of the temperature 
um, as well, which I, which I found a very interesting point and, and, and an important one. And I think that's what Peggy was mentioning that, you know, even the Ukrainian, you know, leadership had to assert, so, you know, this, the sense of calm and calling against panic and really needing to sort of let cooler heads prevail, so to say. So Peggy, I, I wanted to give you a chance. Um, I know you've started us on um, sort of understanding the, how sort of the current crisis could impact ongoing efforts in terms of other arms control discussions um, between the United States and Russia and how it would affect Canada. And then Doug asked, uh, Doug Roach asked a very interesting question and he was saying, you know, that the Canadian government has so far resisted conservative demands to send lethal arms to Ukraine. Can we infer from this that Canada is in fact working behind the scenes to foster productive dialogue between NATO and Russia as well? If you could address, uh, address that that would be uh, much appreciated. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I wish that um, I don't have any evidence. I don't have any evidence that Canada has gone the next step of working behind the scenes to, uh, I mean, in particular, the, the, the positive role that I think is absolutely essential um, is for Canada to put its influence and weight and, and, and expertise behind uh, helping Ukraine implement the Minsk Accords. I mean, it's a very difficult, complicated process uh, against a backdrop of, of two very different views of what, within Ukraine, of what Ukraine should be. And um, uh, the big issues involve minority language rights and also ultimately a, a type of federal system rec recognizing the differences between Western and Eastern Ukraine. And, you know, frankly, as, uh, uh, as um, uh, Canadian experts have pointed out, some Canadian experts have pointed out, this is an area where Canada has a lot of expertise, both, both of those issues. So we can, I mean, cynics will say and uh, will say, uh, oh, Canada has no influence, and this may be true with respect to Russia, because, you know, our, our deputy foreign minister, you know, is persona non grata in, in, in Moscow. But that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is the considerable influence that Canada has with Ukraine and the considerable expertise that we have with Ukraine. So, uh, you know, that, that's what we need to be doing. And that's what we need to be talking about so that the only pressure on the government of Canada is not the pressure from the hardliners in the European uh, Canadian uh, community. Um, uh, so, um, so, I hope very much, I mean, you know, step by step here, it, it, is, it, it was significant that Canada has uh, not, uh, it, it, from the very outset of this crisis, one of the first statements that was made was, uh, was Admiral Ayer, uh, our Chief of Defence Staff, and he said, talking about the type of con military contribution that Canada might make, he said it's a very fine line between deterrence and provocation, uh, and we don't want to escalate because diplomacy is the only way forward. And uh, as and 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 the ultimate military uh, package that we have put forward reflects that very measured. I mean, emphasis on training, uh, non-lethal uh, equipment, and we've also stepped up, you know, considerable funding uh, on the you know to help to help uh, more broadly. Uh, uh, the economy uh, and other, you know, other areas where where Ukraine needs needs help. So I don't have any I don't have any evidence whether we've gone the next step yet. But I most certainly uh, I, I most certainly hope that we do, uh, because um, so that's a really important role for Canada. And of course, something that I hope we also get into is the role that Canada can play with respect to the arms control dimension of this crisis because um, you know as I said the, the the I mean because of the June summit the June 2021 summit and we've got these strategic stability talks relaunched we've got working groups and we've had three rounds of talks uh, but um, you know among other complications um, you know for some of the things that have to be put on the table um, 
uh, not and and uh, I was very pleased that Pavel mentioned uh, you know the role the dark shadow of the American departure from the anti-ballistic missile treaty, the Bush Jr. departure in 2002, the long shadow that has cast over arms control, strategic arms control talks and, and the happy recognition that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in the arms control community and, and, and Biden too, it seems, that a strategic ballistic missile defense has got to be got to be put on the on the on the on the arms control uh, uh, on on the table if meaningful arms control uh, talks are to proceed further with with uh, with Russia uh, uh, and the United States and Canada has a has as a real has a role to play there a very direct role has a, a key role to play there but I'll but I'll, I'll stop uh, anybody that's interested in that can ask me further and of course, if there's an opportunity, I'll talk about other things that we can do on the arms control side, because, uh, you know, there's a very important dimension for Canada to play uh, in support of risk, nuclear risk reduction and in support of Biden's uh, attempt at reducing the role of nuclear weapons in uh, strategic, uh, in American strategic doctrine. And likewise, Canada can play a role to help NATO reduce the role of nuclear weapons and its strategic doctrine. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. And there are so many questions coming in too, and I'm trying to kind of group them and to be able to get to all of them as well. But Caesar, I just want to give you uh, maybe an opportunity to, to give us a bit of a silver lining. Is there a silver lining to the current standoff? Could something good come out of you know the current sort of situation that could lead to perhaps more stable security relations between Russia and the West going forward? Thank you, Branka. And you know, as as you well know, one has to remain an optimist in in, in this line of work. So so we, so we always do look for those silver linings in terms in terms of of the of the crisis. And 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 as you know, you've all heard the crisis. You know, can can be seen and turn into opportunity. So I think that's a that, that's a useful framing in the, in this context. We need to see it as an opportunity. You know, I'm fortunate. The the, the implications are, are are still uncertain, and and the, and the 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 path forward. It's very important in the next few days and weeks, but but on the whole, I think this can be an opportunity really to have a close look at at, at the security arrangements that have dominated you know East West relations, especially since the end of, of the Cold War, and and assess you know how how stable they they are, they have been, and they might be going forward, and 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 we need to to sort of switch the understanding that even acknowledging that these may need to be revisited is a concession on national security grounds or anything of the, of the sort, because it is not. I think it's, it, it serves everybody interest really to have a proper diagnosis of, of what is ca causing threat perceptions here and there on both sides and, and try to, uh, to address them and to do so through a common security lens not through, a, through 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 this this impetus and inertia to always have the upper hand because you know I'm not going to explain the, the the nature of arms racing here but uh, but really the, the 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 approach needs to be changed the, the the militaristic posturing needs to be decreased gradually gradually it can't be done overnight but uh, that's how we end up in uh, with with uh, with the consequences that nobody wants so i think the militaristic posturing needs to be um uh, uh, decrease the, the the nuclear weapons reliance of NATO needs to be abandoned. We need to have conversations about the station of of U.S. nuclear weapons in 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 in, in the soil of European countries. We need to talk about the sovereignty of Ukraine and the and the and the well-being of its people. And it's a, so so these are these are all uh, in the mix and they are thorny, complex issues. But but again, in the context of the current crisis, I think they need to be seen as opportunities for for the escalation. Secondly, this is an opportunity for the Diplomacy and, and and just to echo something that, that that Peggy said earlier, I think this is this is what Canada can and should be doing. We need to be pushing forcefully for diplomatic solutions uh, uh, to this crisis. We need to be engaging not just with the with the Ukrainians that we already know that they're on our side, or you know that there's alignment. We need to be, to be talking to the Russians even. You know that that is the nature of diplomacy. Talk to to the adversary rather than than alienate them, especially in this crisis. That's when the 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 overture, diplomatic 
overtures are are important. It is also an opportunity for arms control. And and Peggy, you know, uh, made 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 some some excellent points. But it's an opportunity for arms control, and it's and it's uh, the, the the nuclear weapons dimension, of course, in terms of, of bilateral relations between Russia and the U.S. and also multilateral processes that are happening this year, including the MPT and 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 the first meeting of the of the, the nuclear ban treaty, but also other arms control processes, including uh, related to lethal autonomous weapon system, related to cybersecurity, related to to new forms of warfare that that, that both the U.S. US and Russia are, are very directly engaged in, and and hopefully, rather than than this crisis exacerbating the impetus to 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 acquire more more weapons or to abandon normative regimes that are aimed at regulating them, hopefully this will this will uh, remind stakeholders of the of the danger of that excessive accumulation of weapons, of nuclear brinkmanship, of 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 not not engaging in good faith in these in these uh, multilateral processes. A problem we need to contend with right now is is the notion of saving face. You know, at the, in, in in the current crisis, I think both sides are going to to politically are going to to want to walk away from this with a with a perceived victory, if only for domestic audiences, but also for international for international audiences. So one hopes that the rhetoric around red lines, that the rhetoric about serious consequences, or the rhetoric ab about about a swift and effective response, you know, is toned down a little bit because 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 uh, the stakeholders might corner themselves into situations that they, that is hard to walk away from without losing face. So, so, so this is where the uh, diplomatic creativity uh, comes in, and uh, and uh, and I think that uh, that as long as both parties can walk away from uh, from this, you know, with some face saving, with some with some claim of victory, with some claim of of, of having achieved certain certain objectives, you know, it's, it's going to help de-escalate. Unfortunately, we're not starting from from scratch, you know, we have the Minsk agreements uh, that 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 the, uh, in the specific uh, case of Ukraine paved the way for 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 real concrete solutions that might that might that might help help de-escalate the crisis. I don't think in the end it's going to serve anybody's security interests, global security interests, or European security interests if Ukraine joins NATO promptly or if it's invaded by Russia. And I think the, the the answer has to be along the line of some sort of, sort of buffer. Uh, that the, the uh, neutrality that uh, that can that can keep both sides uh, at bay and can decrease the threat per, uh, the mutual threat perceptions. Thank you so much, Cesar. And there, are, of course, new processes that we follow on in space and cyber. You know that are sort of coming down the line and other other talks where we we need these um, you know and other challenges you mentioned autonomous weapons where we need these parties to talk we need them to come up with new agreements and, and new measures to to sort of protect global security um, and I, there's so many great questions so I'm going to get to those shortly I just wanted to give um, Pavel and Peggy also maybe a chance to address this question you know how does the international community step back from the security precipice because some of the questions are sort of pointing to that is it the UN like how, how what is the sort of process how do we step back and is there shared room uh, you know is there room for a shared understanding between the United States and Russia that might de-escalate tensions and then and then also you know what is the role for middle powers like Canada can what role do they play in, in this broader discussion maybe Pavel I'll start with you and then I'll get to Peggy yeah, let me let me try. Uh, well, this is a, a difficult uh, question uh, because you're 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 asking what 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 is to be done, and uh, this is the perennial Russian uh, question. I, I think it's uh, it, my take is that uh, there are many ways to de-escalate, uh, and uh, uh, in the immediate uh, crisis. Uh, it is true that there is a diplomacy and all that. Uh, one thing that is missing, I, I, I think, so far uh, in this conversation, not, not in this conversation, but in, uh, in the discussion about this crisis in general, uh, is that uh, this uh, understood still in very uh, adversarial terms, uh, which is, again, which is understandable given, given the, uh, uh, the, 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 the current uh, leadership in, in 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 Russia and the recent uh, policies and recent actions and all that, uh, but uh, when I, I as I mentioned in the beginning when I started, uh, part of the problem that led us to uh, to this situation is that this feeling uh, that Russia being 
uh, excluded, and not only excluded, but uh, Russia, the feeling that this whole security structure is built kind of against Russia. And that I think uh, this, uh, and if you, if you think about this, if you think about the, uh, what is, what Russia can do, Russia could do this kind of a military technical measures, but uh, you don't need to be uh, uh, kind of a very, uh, uh, it's very easy to see that uh, this will not bring any security to Russia or to its neighbors or to NATO or to Europe. Uh, it, it will only get make, make this uh, situation worse. The only uh, uh, the only way for Russia to have the true uh, security guarantees is uh, to become uh, a part of the European community and as a normal quote unquote uh, democratic uh, state. Uh, and uh, we are not there yet, uh, of course, and it might be a long road, but that's the only way out of this. And uh, uh, on the, so, but that, that's for the Russians to kind of uh, sort out internally. Uh, what the uh, West could do, uh, I guess, is to clearly uh, outline this, uh, this prospect and saying that, look, in the end, uh, in the end, the security in, in, in Europe is not about who is allowed to join uh, NATO and who is uh, not allowed to join NATO. Uh, the security in Europe will, uh, will have to come to the point where people would not care whether they are in NATO or not. Whether it won't be an issue for Ukraine or Finland or Russia uh, or Poland, whether Ukraine is part of NATO it would just be irrelevant. And that is a goal I think that everybody could work uh, toward uh, and including Russia. And if this prospect is clearly outlined, uh, I think you could have a lot of Russian, uh, Russian uh, public uh, on board. And, uh, and that counts for something. And in fact, you could have some in the Russian leadership as well. That's my take, thanks. Thank you so much, Pavel. I think it's it's important to sort of have those reminders in place of, of the of the need for some of these structures and dialogues. Peggy, um, did you want to weigh in? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, uh, I think, in fact, maybe I'm overly optimistic here, um, but I, but I think we actually have. Um, <clears throat> I mean, all sides are now reiterating over and over that diplomacy is the only way forward. And they're normalizing, if you will, diplomacy as the only way forward. And um, that is very, very important, not least, and we haven't really discussed this, but is it, but it is, uh, I mean, the, the it is a big factor, and that is the political weakness of President Biden at home and the need, the consequent need. And of course, we see this overwhelmingly with China, but it's equally true in this situation with Russia. The, the, the paramount need in the administration's view not to be seen to be weak on Russia for domestic purposes. And the trouble there, of course, is, is that you end up with this kind of schizophrenic messaging. On the one hand, diplomacy, diplomacy, diplomacy. On the other hand, these extraordinary statements of Biden saying, oh, you know, in my view, in my personal view, they're on, you know, Russia's on the verge of invading when um, Russia at the same time is saying, we have no intention of invading. And I think it's worth noting that they have never threatened invasion. They have quite, uh, quite the contrary, they've consistently said they don't intend to in invade. And of course, uh, uh, Pavel talked very specifically about the wording that they used about military technical uh, responses, which is, you know, has not in my view ever been interpreted. I mean, in normal military parlance as code word for for uh, uh, for an invasion. So we've got this we've got this domestic backdrop which creates this problem uh, with um, with normalizing uh, with normalizing democracy uh, uh, diplomacy. But uh, 
that it, that is, I, and I'm, I hope I'm not being overly optimistic. I think that is happening. I mean, the fact that we've got ongoing, not just one meeting, uh, NATO Russia Council, uh, uh, but but uh, another meeting scheduled, uh, and so at long last, uh, really important discussions that need to take place uh, on that front. And uh, before going any further, you, I mean. Uh, again, coming back to what Canada can do, a wonderful article written uh, by former um, disarmament ambassador uh, Paul Meyer and former foreign minister Lloyd Axworthy in uh, November 2021, where they talked about how Canada, and we haven't heard a peep out of Canada in terms of uh, the ongoing NATO review of its uh, strategic doctrine, where, of course, we, you know, we, 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 we are you know, we are, we should be intimately involved because of it, it affects us so directly. And in that article, they, they made a powerful argument for how Canada should be introducing into that discussion. And this harkens back to the common security comments that have been made uh, by, by Pavel and Cesar, how we should be introducing into that discussion, uh, you know, uh, cooperative, uh, uh, security notions of of cooperative security and of um, diplomacy, um, uh, and uh, so not a word. We haven't heard a word from Canada on on that front. But I did want to come back very very briefly to the to the role that Canada can play, the the quite important role that Canada can play with respect to getting ballistic missile strategic ballistic missile defense onto the strategic arms control agenda between Russia and the United States, because that's absolutely critical to making progress, to making real progress, to ending the arms racing and actually getting risk reductions. I mean, Canada is already contributing uh, in, in North America by staying out by against all pressures, uh, continuing to stay out of participation in strategic ballistic missile defense. And, and of course, we should continue to stay out um, but we can do more than that. I mean, going back to, um, you know, way back to the beginning, to the start of, a, of, 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 of U.S., of the U.S. Uh, infatuation with, um, with uh, a strategic ballistic missile defense, uh, the 1994, 19, um, uh, the 1984-85 strategic defense initiative. Uh, when they started doing research into strategic ballistic missile defense, you know, there was a huge debate going on inside the American administration between uh, the Secretary, Secretary of State Schultz and the, the State Department arguing the strict interpretation of the ABM treaty, which might allow some research, but certainly no development, and the Pentagon view, the broad interpretation, the Weinberger view, uh, which basically would have gutted the ABM treaty. Now that was a bilateral treaty during the Cold War, but Canada, I mean, the global security uh, was at what would be impacted here because of course, removal of the strictures of the ABM treaty, um, you know, the fear was, and, and it's been played out, was that it would be a spur to offensive arms racing. And that's exactly what happened. So Canada spoke up then, and Canada needs to speak up now. We know that Biden wants to do this, and Canada can play a role in supporting that, uh, you know, those, those desires and those efforts by, uh, by President Biden. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. And I know there's a lot and we, you know, we said there's so many aspects to this discussion and I wanted to also give Cesar and we're unfortunately running out of time, which is, I think, a good thing because this is this shows us how much more there is to really think about and say. And I've also noted, um, you know, the, this, uh, the comment from um, Yaroslav Bukura, who talks about, you know, like, where is sort of the Ukrainian uh, view and where is the sort of the Ukrainian this, this point in the discussion, you know, and there's a really great article by Richard Gowan from um, the International Crisis Group, I believe, you know, who lays out the UN diplomacy and really talks about how all of these other things are impacting Ukraine security and, and that sense of, you know, is Ukraine sort of voiceless in these discussions and how these dynamics uh, show, you know, shape really Ukraine's domestic security. 
Um, so I think, um, you know, it's, it's hard to get all of the perspectives and all of the discussions in, but we're trying to sort of really highlight the, the multiple and global security dimensions here, just to note that um, th these kinds of contexts really can be um, a very fraught for domestic populations. And then there are all these other considerations, of course, that happen. Um, and so it becomes a very difficult, I think, situation. Uh, and I really empathize, I think, and I think we all do empathize with sort of the, the population in Ukraine and stuff and sort of seeing your, your you know, your, your security play out and be impacted by so many other factors. But Cesar, I wanted to give you a, a quick chance uh, on this. And there's so many great questions uh, that I really wish we could get to all of them. But was there something that you wanted to weigh in, Cesar, on this sort of right. sense of Right, very briefly. Dialogue? Yeah, thank you, Branka. Just, I mean, to build on Peggy, we've, I guess, referred to this in different ways, common security, cooperative security. But I, I'd like to emphasize that point. I mean, if we, if we continue having adversarial security arrangements that define the relationship between the East and the West, you know, adversarial outcomes will emerge and no one should be surprised at that. You know, there is a, there is a cause and effect relationship between 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 the, the, the instability and, and the tensions that we're seeing today. So I would, I would, I, I would repeat the point I made, made earlier that uh, even if hopefully this will be the case, even if the immediate tension is diffused uh, through diplomacy and, and through the work of middle powers like Canada pushing for diplomacy, one hopes the you know the bigger question of of the of the of the instability or relative stability uh, of of the of the Western security arrangements vis-a-vis -vis the East vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know Russia and and, uh, and others. Uh, we'll need to demand our, our creativity and ideas and, 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 and a reformulation of what those security arrangements are, because uh, I think this crisis itself is evidence that it is not by definition a stable security arrangement, that, that, that there are some stakeholders that will feel threatened, some stakeholders that will feel uh, insecure, and, 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 and that leads to tensions. So, so yeah, once again, I think this is an opportunity for, for diplomacy, an opportunity for arms control, but primarily an opportunity for rethinking security arrangements, demilitarizing the, the, the lens through which East-West relations uh, are, are seen, and, and hopefully move towards common security arrangements that, that, are, that are not a concession on security grounds, but rather, as the name implies, in everybody's security benefit. Well, thank you so much. I know there, there's quite a few questions and quite a few good questions, um, but I hope we've tried or at least touched on some of the, the, the points that were raised in different ways. Um, and Pavel, thank you so much, Peggy, Caesar. This has been a really sort of I hopefully measured and nuanced discussion for everyone, maybe one that isn't easily found. And that was sort of our aim today, really just to try and touch on a few things. And we know that um, I, know, I think Caesar mentioned there's going to be, you know, probably dissertations written about this, of course, um, and various analysis. So uh, we wanted to just th say thank you so much for um, all, all, all the, to all the panelists and for the discussion and for your time and to uh, the audience members, apologies that we couldn't get to all the questions, but it's been truly great to see the chat. We're going to aim to post um, this webinar on our YouTube uh, channel. And then hopefully if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to us um, and anything specifically directed to the panelists, please send it our way as well. And we'll try and answer those questions as well. So it's been a true pleasure. I uh, have a lovely evening, Pavel and Peggy and Cesar. Enjoy the bit of sunshine we get before the next storm sets in. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thanks for thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ranka.